All right, I'm delighted to say Anthony Nash is with us. Anthony, how are you? I'm great. I thought you were after getting rid of me, Joe. Oh, not at all. Not that easy. Uh, <laughs> we nearly started the championship with a bang last weekend. Uh, I think it would have, would have been a bang if Antrim had won and if Waterford had won, but it was getting close to a uh, fever pitch. So what? What's, how do you feel about the whole thing right now? Um... Actually, it was on last Thursday night there with um, Eddie Brennan. We both said off the air before we joined it that Dublin Antrim game wasn't going to be um, as one-sided maybe as people thought. Uh, like Antrim at home is obviously a tricky fixture and we just don't know where Dublin are at the moment. Um, you know, they seem to be kind of fits and sports. Like, you know, sometimes in the league they were looking like they were coming together and obviously like they're one of the best managers in Ireland. So at the start of the year, we were hopeful that, and like I'm hopeful that Dublin come good. I, I think I'm, I'm a big believer and, you know, we want as many teams competing as possible, but uh, Antrim at home have just become a, a very tough fixture for a lot of teams as Clare found out in the league last year. Waterford and Limerick was, yeah, I think there was enough explosion inside and no <laughs> involved in the game itself without having any other ones. But um, I think, look, it's probably uh, like John Coyley came out after right and was saying like, that people are trying to soften them up by saying they're so great and, you know, and all that, but I, I really think just look Limerick got out of got out of the, the game with a win. I wouldn't say got out of jail or anything, but just got out of the game with a win and just look far from there. Yeah, I think that whole uh, John Kiley thing isn't really aimed at us uh saying Limerick are great because no one's gonna change their mind because John Kiley tells yeah. us to stop it. It's clearly aimed at the players, you know, stop yeah. listening to the stuff that everybody tells you about six in a row, go and win the bloody fourth one and then we might even be after we on our holiday, on our team holiday next year, we might allow you to all have a thought about five and shut up about six, basically, was the Yeah, message. no, big, big time. Listen, like, and I, like, I did a piece there this week, like, and I was saying that, like, look, I, I give Limerick credit, as you do, because they deserve it. It's not that we're trying to knock them down by making them soft or anything like that. This team deserves all the credits and all the plaudits they're after getting because what they've done is just exceptional. And, like, you know, again, not too dissimilar to the Dublin footballers and Kilkenny hurlers at the time, but, like, the, the one thing we learned there from, from Gary Keegan was about keeping the inside in and the outside out, like, you know, and you do lean on supporters for your 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 um, motivation at times and help through games, and it does benefit, like, you know, and there's no point saying otherwise, but sometimes when you're meeting people on the street, they're trying to be nice, but also, if you decide to let it in, like, that pat in the back is very close to the kick in the arse, like, you know. Well, like, what, you know, say you are friends or an acquaintance or a work colleague of one of the Limerick hurlers. Like, beyond, there's not much that you can say to them beyond saying, geez, you're, you're going well, aren't you? Like, it's yeah. hard for that crowd as well. If you just, just for a second to think about it, like, what am I supposed to say to this person that isn't, that he hasn't heard a million times? Beyond, like, geez, it's going well, I wish you all the best. But, like, you know. I don't know. It must be a very difficult situation yeah. for everybody involved. Yeah, but uh, you you summed it up though. You summed it like it's up to the players. Like we learned it in our latter stages. Like as I said, sports psychology. When they came into the game, and I was kind of leaving it. Um, and as many people would say, I was mad enough. I probably should have started my career with it. Like, but uh, most goalkeepers should. Um, but like Gary was just very good for that. Like that. Look, yeah, you, of course you can hear it. But it's up to you what you do with it. It's like me giving you advice. Like you can listen to me if you want. Like I'm a teacher. Trust me. Half my students don't listen to me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> they, they they try to listen, but they take it in and fire out the other side. Like it's just, and that's the side of it. Like everyone's going to be polite and nice to Limerick recorders because of what they're being doing. Um, no, obviously they have the other side of the discipline issues and stuff like that. But like you know, it's up to the Limerick players whether they, and they're look. Listen, they're well experienced in that. They've named a team, and Declan Hannan is in the team, but Garrod mm. Haggerty isn't in the team. Mm. Uh, the the uh, the teams named and the um, likelihood of that team actually taking the field you know we don't believe them anymore but is there a little subtle message in the okay you're named on the bench here for this game Garrod um, I, I, I was surprised I won't lie no. and in fairness to Garrod right like like, yeah, like people are going to you know put on any comments and they say ah, he's a dirty fecker like, like I empathise with him at times because like the man is six foot six or whatever he is and when he goes to hit a shoulder He's hitting someone else a lot smaller. Do you know what I mean? No, look, he got sent off in like the second yellow was deserved and all that. But like, he does get a hard time of it. I find sometimes, and he the hits he receives, like sometimes are OTT and he doesn't go down. You know what I mean? And so I don't know what John is trying to do there, as you said. And that's the other thing. Like, like you know, they're naming Declan Hannon. We don't know. Maybe he is fit. Maybe he's not fit. And maybe Garrod will play and someone else will drop back and stuff like that. But um, look. And that's the other thing, like, you know, where do you stand on the on the teams yourself? Like, what, what do you think? Like, is the, people are giving out nuts about it, like, you know, and I find it very hard as a manager to kind of, you know, put out a real team on a, on a, on a time frame, like, but... Is the time frame... Is the time frame the issue? Is that the problem? Like, 
Well, it's it's just it's just like every team have got a top end statistics, like statistics team or whatever like that, and and they're looking to probe. And I suppose they're just trying to get a little advantage by maybe just saying, look, I'm not naming Jor today, but you know he's going to start corner forward to maybe put him off the scent. That's all it is. You know what I mean? Like, and I know everyone's at an uproar because they want to hear the team and they want to do it. Like, but I, I don't know. Are we ever going to come to a time? Um, where 15 and 15 are named as they are. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, other sports just do it an hour before throw in or kick off, yeah. really. And uh, you name the squad, and the squad can't change, so you know who's going to play. But there's a smaller match day squad in other sports. Tipperary tried to do that last week and got absolutely slated, didn't they? Do you know what I mean? And in a lot of parts where they name numbers and stuff like that, didn't as well. Like, but I don't know. Like, it's like. Like I empathise with both sides it's just, as a supporter you love hearing a team on a Thursday or Friday night and be able to go down to your friends and go geez that's going to be some match up here that's going to be this that and the other and you're unable to do that because you said like what are the chances of Groot Hegarty playing we don't know do you know what I mean like chances are maybe he will is Declan Hannon fit or not but I suppose it adds to it in another capacity as well but I don't think any manager is ever going to agree to 100% redeeming the teams the way it is at the moment like in giving a team a two day advantage like as you said is there any other sport that uh, like you know rugby I know like my name or whatever like that but like soccer is more beforehand and stuff but it's going to it's going to rumble on until until a decision is made. Now. Yeah, well, the, the Leinster Toulouse teams were named at noon today, and we know exactly yeah. what's going to. And there'll be no changing from that unless there's um, mm. a, a last second uh, injury. And there's there is something to that. Like so, we we do yeah. you can you do better analysis and have more informed conversations and uh, WhatsApps go around about who's not in and who isn't, and it just adds a little bit to the tension. And you know what? The other side of it, in like, is we don't know, like, and it's not standing up for Limerick. But maybe Declan Hannon is doing a fitness test today. Maybe he's doing one tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Maybe like Gerard Hegarty could be carrying it. Like, I'm sure, like that Waterford Limerick game, for whatever else it was, was very intense. It was so physical. You know, bodies I can guarantee you were bruised. They're two big teams colliding into each other. We don't know, and we're just assuming because Gerard Hegarty got sent off sitting the sideline. Maybe there's other things to it. And John Coyley is never going to come out and explain himself like he doesn't have to, like any other manager. There might be other reasons. We're just assuming that it's Gerard Hegarty is getting, look, you sit down, no, after getting sent off again, like, you know, but like Declan Hannon could potentially be doing a fitness test. I, I thought he was potentially gone for longer, like, but like, we're not to know. The Clare team has also been named and there is a significant change in that uh, Ivor Quilligan comes in in goals mm. and mm. I, that's, that's obviously tricky. I, I did hear, I don't know, was it on the hurling pod the lads were saying that they wouldn't have been surprised if they'd made the chance, the change at half time and if Fowdy was going to come back out for the second half but he did. He's not going to get a second opportunity and look, you're a goalkeeper, you've obviously potentially been through experiences like this. Sometimes the decision has to be made and it's the right thing but it can't be easy. Oh, it's tough. I feel very sorry for him now, like, you know, and even I was think I was I was of the opposite note to the lads, like I was thinking, would they stick with him again this week? Like, you know, they obviously went through a league campaign and trusted him to be their number one. And then I know no look, Jesus Christ, there was mistakes we made and stuff like that, but I felt they're gonna stick. You no, know, Ivor Quilligan is a good goalkeeper. He obviously was nominated for an all star either last year or the year before as well, like a fine goalkeeper. So they are kind of lucky to have him there. But I, like Eva Quilligan's coming in against the best setup team now in Ireland for Puck Outstone in the Gaelic Crowns, like so it's an interesting game for him and maybe they just felt that that the uh, that his mentality would have led to being, you know, more solid to the defence. But I wouldn't wish that a bad day, especially a bad debut on any goalkeeper, like because potentially that could be his only game for Clare in championship and you know, you don't want to be remembered. Like it nearly happened to me sure in two thousand seven, like when I played against Water and I left in five goals, you know. Um when Don Logue was suspended. Like I had dreams going into that that I keep a clean sheet and maybe push Don low going forward and stuff like that and then I went in and Dan Shanahan and John Milan and Paul Flynn decided they were just going to riddle me you know and then for a lot, for about five or six years after that I said is that it? Is that me done? You know am I the goalkeeper that played once for Cork left in five goals and you know is going to be forever remembered as that like and uh, fortunately enough you know for me is I, I got a second debut and got a second chance but it's not a nice place for him to be you know and uh, I just hope he's mentally okay after it what was the, the difference in time between the first one and the second one? 2007, 2012, I think. Good five, six years of a gap. And then in between that, no, there was a long time where I was thinking, right, I'm gone here. I'm going to head away or I'm going to finish off my career or I'm going to do this, that and the other. And like without an injury to Don Logue, I still would be sat here. I wouldn't be sat here, I mean. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I would have been gone off the panel or whatever like that. But um, but yeah, I, like, you know, a turn of events got me in. Like, But I could feel, you know, as a goalkeeper, it's a, look, it's a ball. It's a ball. You've one position to fight for. You know what I mean? That's it. You're either the best or you're the second best. And why did you keep going for those five years? Stupidity. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't, like I was offered opportunities to go to America during that period and pulling off the panel. And you know, I used to enjoy going to training. I travel. It's ironic. No, I used to travel to training with Ben and Jerry O'Connor. And I mean, with Ben, obviously, with the twenties now and stuff. And I used to enjoy it. And I loved hurling. And you know, I probably did beneath it all as I was a home bird. I was afraid to go travelling. Like you know, 
I was a mammy's boy, um, probably still am. <laughs> but like I, uh, I didn't really want to go uh, to to thing, but like pulling off the panel in, I was thinking like, sure, I'm going to be playing hurling anyway. I might as well be above in the best setting in Cork and enjoying it. But it was frustrating on match days. I was, you know, you're inside the dressing room after the game and everyone's getting a high five and you're being skipped. And then some days you didn't make the match day panels and stuff like that, like you know. But um, but look, as I said, what happened happened. Like, and I was, but I was, it was extremely lucky for me. You know what I mean? That it happened the way it did. Yeah, there's a great piece by Conor McKeown in the Indo today about the two uh, Tipperary goalkeepers who were in charge of uh, Wexford and Antrim this weekend. Mm. And uh, there's obviously three goalkeepers um, in senior management in the top tier in hurling and obviously David Herity as well is there something about the modern goalkeeper and the responsibility that they have for being quarterbacks game starters you know deep tactical thinkers you're laughing at that there is it? Is it just they're probably just crazy enough to take on a team like it's just like you know they always say like all of my friends will say you have to be a little bit mad to be a goalie and then there's me like you know what I mean like all right, I think we're just I think stu- like your students at a game if you're to be a good goalkeeper you have to be a student like you know I used to work very close with Sean O'Donnell when he was a Cork he used to break down clips to me of opposition's puck outs and their setup for puck outs and I used to sit down with him for hours on end and look at them like you know and uh, I enjoyed it like and I loved hurling like um, and I suppose you get a few of how the whole game is going um, you know so I definitely think that there's a side of that like but no matter what position you play in you just have to have a love for it like you know like the the three lads you spoke about and then Davy obviously didn't as well. Like, you know, you have to be huge passion um uh, for the game as well. But I definitely think we study the game a little bit more than opposition than other positions. Other positions are focusing on one man, we're focusing on a whole team and our own team. Then as well, you're trying to you know, get your own setup going well while helping the forward set up well for the opposition puck outs and obviously starting your own puck outs for their setup. So it's a lot more time spent than, you know, visual for me it was anyway. I can't speak for every other goalkeeper like but Yeah, Kevin De Bruyne referred to them as uh, set pieces um in the post-match interview that he did where he was explaining uh, Arsenal's press the other night and it, like it, when you think about it like that it is a set piece and you have 30 set pieces mm-hmm. which nobody else has the same number really. Yeah. And so therefore yeah. you do have to think about how the impact is going to have like a little bit a little bit like chess. Um Yeah, big know, time, big time. Multiple yeah, moves. Big time down. Like yeah. Like like you you like so for me, at the end of my career, and what I try thinking is like, for an offensive puck coach, you actually have to be set up defensively. I'm not trying to confuse people here now, like, but you have to assume that like you're trying to win it, but you have to be set up well when you do lose it. Like, do you know what I mean? And I think that was a big thing for me as well towards the end of it. So like, you are completely looking at every aspect of the game, how a corner forward sets up, where he's going to be and stuff like that. So there's definitely a part of it where we have to be more, uh, you know, visual and you know, in tune with what the rest of the team are doing. Yeah. One last thing on the goalkeeper's front and, and uh, just to stick with Davey, um, huge praise from Derek McGrath in the Examiner today as well for the performance that and the, the level of detail that Waterford had in their performance last week and he compares and contrasts, you know, Paul Connerk considered an absolute genius and Davey considered a madman and that's completely wrong. He thinks that like if Connerk was doing what... Bra- what um, uh, Davy was doing we'd all be oh wow look at what he did and uh, in fairness like Waterford got all of the tactical stuff right there was just execution uh, operationally they fell down strategically they were bang on yeah like I was just wondering is Derek McGrath to throw another axe into Waterford's year after his comments about him last year um, saying that they'd win the All-Ireland or whoever would be Waterford would win the All-Ireland um, I, look I have to agree like look again I, I've spoken many a time that you either the people love Davy and whatever like that and I thought he got a bit of a going over like to say that he wasn't tactical himself like or whatever like that like he's been look what he did with Wexford like you know what I mean like he took Wexford to the Leinster title um, and each year they were becoming a team to improve everywhere he's gone he's won not Ireland with Clare he's gone into Waterford I know he, the last time in Waterford mightn't have been amazing but this time at Waterford like he's he's gotten a team that really probably put it up the most to any team that have done against Limerick. Um, and as like as a Cork supporter, I'm really, really wondering what this weekend is going to bring with Waterford and Cork. Um, but yeah, I think he deserves the credit for what he's doing. Um, I, I wouldn't consider him a madman. I think he's an extremely passionate man when it comes to hurling. I think he would never lie about that or ever apologise to that to anyone. Like he's extremely passionate, but I think he's doing a doing a great job. No, look, it's still he could go out next Sunday lose. They could be potentially fighting a you know an out uh, like that, but. He's conscious too that it's just that was only one game and they have to move on again this Sunday without potentially without Ty Borka for the rest of the year, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, he's definitely gone. It's um and it's terrible yeah, for him. Achilles and it's brutal. Yeah. Like I feel so sorry for him because like that's another career or year ending injury. Like he's been through some all and when he is playing, I hate playing against him. Like you know, and that's a compliment. 
he's such an intelligent hurler and uh Anytime I met him off the field, was a nice guy as well. And you know what? As an opposition hurler, you never want to hear a fella being gone for a season. You might be too disappointed if it was a one-game injury when you were playing him, but <laughs> but for a year-ending one. So look, I just hope he's, he, you know, for him, his own sake, because he's, geez, he's, he's been riddled there the last few years for such an exceptional hurler. Uh, talk to us about then the Cork team that we expect for the game against Waterford. Uh, a lot of familiar faces. I know that there had been some hope or calls amongst uh, some Cork fans that there would be wholesale change that's not going to be the case and it probably shouldn't be given the level of expertise and experience you know and uh, uh, yeah like I, I said at the start of the year it was going to be 12 or 13 last year's team starting and, I, and it, it was always going to be the case I thought Pat used the league very intelligently he's after finding the likes of Brian Roach there and even he's given huge game time to Eaton Toomey Brian O'Sullivan and all these lads with I still agree with the majority of the team he's put out if not all of it um, and I know people in the public are going to be very frustrated hearing that because we haven't been successful with that team, but you know, being involved in the twenties there at the moment, physically and hurling wise, you know, it takes a good few years for any lad to step up from twenties to senior. Um, and they're getting closer. Those players, the likes of Brian Hayes coming across, is obviously huge for hurling as well. But Brian is only hurling for one year, so you know, I'm not saying they're going to ride off this year, and Pat won't ever say that, and, and nor will he mean it either. Um, but I do think that they have to be patient with this team because I think he's had to put out the best team available to him at the moment. Um, now, you know, it's it, what team will finish the game or start the game even might be different. But I, I look, it's frustrating maybe for certain sectors, as you said, but like, why would you throw in a young fella that just isn't ready yet? You're, that you're thinking of damaging his career then at the same time, you know? So what's the level of confidence about actually winning the game then on Sunday? Yeah, like, there's very kind of nervous vibes around Cork at the moment because... Like when you're the team that ha- you're, when you're the only team in Munster that hasn't played a game, it, no matter who you are, it is a difficult one to kind of say like because you're going off league form, and if we're going off the last game in the league, it was Kilkenny. But I often say like, look at that team compared to the team that's gone out Sunday with a lot more experience now, and a lot more important players. The Cork still, like Cork still can't do without Jamie Harrity. Cork still can't do without Patrick Horgan. You know what I mean? Like, and for the likes of them to be playing on Sunday, it's a huge boost. Um, so, like, I I believe, and like I, I as in the piece said, like. They have to match Waterford's intensity. We all know what they're going to bring. They're going to bring majority of bodies to the middle third. They're going to create overlaps. If you don't tackle back, those overlaps are going to kill you. If you turn them over, there's huge space in the defence then because they're flooded forward. Caleb Lyons coming off the shoulder. He gets that hand passes to score. You turn him over, you've got a huge gap behind him that's going to create an opportunity for you, which Tipperary did in the league. I think they got four goals or five goals or whatever in the league. But like, you have to match them. It's the only thing you have to go to and let the hurling flow after that. But if you don't match Waterford's intensity and pace, they're going to rip through you, and it doesn't matter who you are. Um, so you just really have to get... Like, their game plan is built on speed, energy, tackling, fitness, bodies around the brakes. You have to beat them. And if you don't, then your hurling won't have anything to do with it because you just won't have the ball. Um, we, we talked about the goalkeeping change in the, in the Clare game. What type of performance do you expect from Clare this week in the aftermath of last week where they're not desperate yet because you could still potentially mm. lose the first two games and maybe everybody's writing the game against Limerick off but like if they were to get something from this it has the potential to like really guarantee them a place in the All-Ireland series and then set them up for a run to a potential Munster final so there's a lot on offer but if they get hammered and if they don't perform then it could be a disaster and then the season could be a write-off there you go that's it exactly and the one team that won fear Limerick is clear because majority of those players went to school together played uh, colleges hurling together so they won't hold any of the Limerick players on the pedestal either like, and that was shown last year in the Munster final as well Like, probably the best game of the year You know, probably the best game the last few years but a performance has to come like because you're after conceding five goals against Tipperary you know, I know Limerick don't go for goals as much as other opposition but the one thing that John Coyley would do a lot to Brian Cody they'll pick and train their weaknesses like you know um, so Eva Quilligan is going to be in for a night of you know constant perfect setup. his puck outs will have to be on it's an interesting one for him I, I don't like go back to the goalkeeper again but like he was told last week he was number two in Clare so his head was obviously in the gutter for the last week and a half, two weeks before he was, do you know what I mean? And he probably knew coming into weeks beforehand he was, and now all of a sudden he's going against the other champions. So he has to have a good night. Um, but like Clare are a team that always put up to Limerick. No matter the 1990s, all the way, it doesn't matter. There's always a bitter rival between them. So I'd expect a big performance from Clare. Um, I, I think that the likes of Tony Kelly really needs to start to spread his wings. He's going to talk Carl Barrett like his Carl Barrett. Like, but um, Tony needs to have a, a monstrous game for, for Clare again the next night. And... Uh, and look, I, I look. I, I would say Limerick will win, but again, I expect a tight, close game. 
um, and that will maybe kick start clear again now. There was another interesting line buried in the middle of the Derek McGrath column. Uh, can you imagine the vitriolic rush to condemn Davy post Ennis last Sunday if it was him who had masterminded an incoherent game plan that afforded 100 yards of space to the Tipperary forwards and lacked any defensive cover? Brian Lowen's liner bodied by uh, Derek McGrath in the column today. Going, what? What? Uh, yeah. But I, I mean, were they, was it entirely incoherent or was it just those individual errors? I, like, I, didn't, I didn't watch the game in uh, live, so mm-hmm. I, I didn't see the full ebb and flow of it. Yeah, I'd say, like, to be fair, I think the individual errors just came at the wrong time. Do you know what I mean? Like as well, I just thought the game couldn't get flowing for Clare. But like on the flip side of that, Clare scored was a three twenty. So like, like Clare offensively have got some of the best forwards. Like I worked with Mark Rogers inside Newell. Like and you know you've Tony Kelly. You've got like, like it's they still have an exceptional side. Like so, I Brian Lowen won't give a shit about what what that says or anything like that. Brian Lowen's going to go out on Saturday night with his tactics. They're going to be bullheaded. They're going down to the Gaelic Crowns. You know I, I think it's going to lead to a fantastic game of hurling. Um, and I think Limerick will have to be at their best again to win, you know. Uh, and that's the way they're looking at it. Like, if they're at their best, they win. But Clare, 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 I think Clare are going to come, you know, it's an old statement, all guns blazing, like, I suppose, really, and, and play to their game plan, which, you know, it might be simplistic, but it's just about hard work, honesty of effort, and uh, I think it's going to be a cracking game. But, I, I look, I wouldn't be overly reading into to, to that. Like, you know, he has his points, I understand, Derek, like, but I wouldn't be as, as negative on the Clare performance. It was one game. You know, um, we might be able to say it after Saturday night, but we we'll definitely have a, a far more evidence anyway, one way or the other. The other big yeah. game, of course, is um, uh, Derek Ling and Kilkenny against Henry Shefflin and Galway, and it's in Nolan Park on Saturday, on Sunday afternoon. Um, I, it obviously, it was slightly different for Henry Shefflin going up against uh, his former manager, and we we know all the uh, controversy around the handshake and all that nonsense, but. This is actually somebody who he played with. Like Derek Ling was in the half forward line when he started and moved back into midfield. And they would have literally been in the same space together. It's uh, just an interesting subplot to this. You know, I know the the two Tipperary goalkeepers are actually going up against each other. They were friends and, and rivals for the position as well. Um, so it's rivalry week in GA. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just a, I, like I hadn't I hadn't really thought about that subplot up until this morning. I was like, that is actually genuinely interesting. Two two people who were properly teammates going up against each other and Henry you know I'm sure under different circumstances would probably prefer to be in the Kilkenny dugout yeah mm-hmm. yeah look I, I, I'd say I'd say if timing had come better he would be it's a, you know what I mean if things hadn't fallen I think the Kilkenny job was probably the one he was going to be getting um, what does it do it probably puts it in your own head you'd like to win a little bit more you know what I mean like but again Henry and, and all those managers are not going to use the opposition and manager for any motivation do you know what I mean like I don't think in this scenario you know, whether Henry used the first for Cody or vice versa I think mean, maybe there was words all right that, that Brian had said something last year in addressing him to the Kilkenny players about Shefflin like but I, like you're still focusing on your team Henry Shefflin is a Galway manager on Saturday or, or the weekend like he's a Galway manager and that's it and that's all he's going to focus on getting his team right I know in your heartstrings you're going up to Nolan Park and you're you're carrying a Galway team into your own home but he's been given a job you know and that's the one thing about sport like I always find that managers moving around in soccer like that like you're selfish like you want your team to win and Henry's a Galway manager and the two lads like Wexford and Antrim they're Wexford and Antrim managers like you know so when you're taking out your own county and you're given a job like I went to UL I went to college in UCC and CIT when I was at UL I wanted UL to win and that's my selfish nature like I want to be successful but I want the lads to be successful and that's the same as any manager as well that Henry is a Galway manager and he wants Galway to win in Kilkenny more than anything uh, last one for you then, right? So obviously they're killing each other in Munster at the moment and uh, generally this is this is obviously the toughest game that Kilkenny and Galway have but after that it'll get a bit easier for them um, than certainly the bear pit that is Munster. Is this advantageous to the teams in Leinster who are competing for the All-Ireland? So I fell into the I fell into the trap last year of saying that the Munster teams were better than the Leinster teams, you know what I mean? But like what it was for me was that it was the competitive nature of Munster was better than the competitive nature of Leinster. Kilkenny came out and Galway came out and beat Cork and, and Clare and blew my theory out of the water. I know it's only one of games and stuff like that. But I definitely think that there's there's a huge gap in the in the um standard of competition in both provinces. I'm not gonna fall into the trap again and say there's a standard difference in teams. Because Kilkenny again, obviously, and I still think Kilkenny are the kingpins in in Leinster at the moment. But there's definitely something that can be looked at there, like where you know I know Westmead drew at Wexford last year or beat Wexford, West drew with them, wasn't there or something like that? And but like most of the time, unfortunately for those teams, they're they're seen as the whipping boys of the competition, and you know they're you train harder those weeks and you can get bodies in and stuff like that, and you're not maybe going as hard. So there's definitely a huge advantage. 
because you can train better during the league without like I'd say those Limerick and Waterford lads facing into the weekend like I know Clare are the same like but that Limerick and Waterford game was so intense and there's no down week like there's like you've got Limerick if they win they go through whatever you've Clare fighting for their lives you've Cork I believe the pressure's on Cork this weekend as well because you've two home games first and you're travelling to Ennis and the Gaelic Grounds in fighting for your life you don't want to be in a position where you've no win going down there but I think the pressure is just huge in Munster absolutely massive and I know I know you'll argue the pressure is huge in Leinster but the pressure is huge in Leinster for four teams and from Norr putting their hand up as well but like it was always between the Wexfords the Dublins and uh, and uh, you know now the Andrums to fight out for the last two or the last one I mean but like in Munster it's anybody so there, I, I definitely believe in, in competition wise there's a huge difference and I do believe you I, like a team that comes out of Munster is obviously well tested but a team coming out of Leinster probably has a better kind of uh get around a balance of, of, of performance and training you know alright we've got to leave it there for this week Anthony enjoy the weekend thanks no a million cheers super thanks sir it's uh, Anthony Nash there and uh, a reminder of course that uh, all of our hurling on Off the Ball is brought to you in association with Borg Gosh Energy uh, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship and the Legends Tour Series at Croke Park Hurling on Off the Ball with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship.